everybody, Scout Crafty here again. It's Friday, TGIF. You made it through another week, and thank goodness for that. Uh, for some of you, this has been a little bit of a trying week. You know, on the East Coast here, we have a couple storms heading up the coast, but that's always good. A little rain brings some extra greenery to the area. Um, today, we are honoring the Navy. That's our branch of the service that we're going to honor today, and that is the United States Navy. Uh, the United States Navy, second biggest branch in the military. It uh, has a tremendous budget, too, by the way. And as you know, the Marine Corps is a, is a subsidiary of the, uh, of the Navy. And uh, what's interesting about the Navy, I have stories about just about every branch of the, uh, of the service. But um, it's funny that uh, one of the guys mentioned, uh, one of our subscribers mentioned uh, the other day, he was a CB in the in the navy and uh congratulations to him that's a uh, a fantastic uh mos to have in this in the uh, navy or uh um and a cb what a cb is is uh it's a kind of a combat engineer in the uh in the navy and i knew an old cb back when i was uh i guess i was about 15 years old my friend lived next to this older gentleman and one day we were talking and it turns out he was a CB in the Navy in World War II. And what I found so interesting is that he was stationed at Pearl Harbor. And uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, there was a bunch of ships, you know, 19 ships were damaged and some sunk. And, but uh, all but two of those ships were raised up and uh, put back into service. And, uh, well, the three of them actually was the, uh, as you know, the Arizona, which is still there, still underwater. And uh, there was, I believe, the Oklahoma and Utah. The, the, those are the three battleships that uh, um, that were let go. And the reason was they, they could have fixed the Oklahoma and Utah, but they were considered obsolete. So they said, we're just going to kind of uh, let the one go down and, and we'll scrap the other one. So, uh, very interesting. All those ships that were damaged uh, were back and uh, put out to sea and, and uh, again came to, uh, to participate in World War II. Uh, unfortunately, there was about 2,400 uh, military personnel that were uh, killed during that attack, so you can never get that back. But uh, as far as the equipment, uh, I was always amazed as a kid to realize that those ships were put back in service. They were refloated fixed and uh, back in service. So uh, so today we salute the United States Navy. Have a, uh, another quick Navy story. I think story. my first introduction to the United States Navy and, uh, and why I was so enamored by it was uh, 1977. I was a young man in Boy Scouts and uh, one of our scout trips was to Fall River, Massachusetts where they have Battleship Cove. And uh, Battleship Cove has uh, a couple ships on display there that were uh, World War II ships. And uh, they have, I believe, it was the uh, battleship, it was the Massachusetts. And they had the, uh, the Lionfish uh, submarine and the Kennedy Destroyer. I think those were the three at the time. And uh, what was so great was uh, for the camping trip, which it was for us, uh, we were able to sleep over on, in, on the battleship overnight and uh, sleep in the original bunks that the original World War II uh, sailors slept in. It was just fantastic. And then we got to eat. Uh, we had mess, which was breakfast and, and lunch we had at the uh, in the mess quarters. And it was it was just like being a in this in the, as a sailor for a couple days. And I just fell in love with it. And that's probably one of the reasons that eventually I was just drawn to the military. I, I think it's such a fantastic opportunity for young boys to be able to go and sleep over on that ship and, and see what it's like. And, and, you know, you know, right away, if you have that kind of calling and it was just a fantastic trip and it's called Fall River, uh, Battleship Cove in Massachusetts. And they have a, uh, a museum there, just like here in the city, we have the Intrepid, uh, and there's a few of them around, but if you ever get a chance to visit one of those fantastic uh, opportunities to see, and you, you really get uh, amazed at how big these battleships were, you know, I mean, they were huge and uh, and how much weight they carried and what a great machinist shop they had on board. And just it was a fantastic experience. So, again, hats off to the uh, United States Navy 
And uh, any of you veterans out there, I love the stories for you Army veterans that I put in the uh, comments. So if you have anybody in the Navy that served or if you had a father or a friend that served, let us know in the comments. I really appreciate it. And uh, with that, let's get on with today's show. Okay, so for today's first project, I thought since we're doing some military uh, branch of the service uh, respect this month, I thought we would uh, tackle this military lock that was given to me by my good friend, Bruce Groton. And uh, this you could see is a Reese, and uh, it is a brass lock. And <clears throat> you can see it is a military lock. It's marked with U.S., and it also has a stamp serial number on top. Now, what's interesting about when they say about military spec, a lot of times, especially in the 80s, this was a big thing. They would say meets or exceeds military spec or military spec. You got to understand something. When they say military spec, it's short for sp uh, specifications, there might be a dozen or two dozen specifications for this lock that the military requires. And this, by specifications, I mean, for example, the military requires that when the key is inserted, it can't be removed with the lock open. Okay, so I can't take this key out of here as, as long as the lock is open. They do that so that it can't get uh, misplaced or things like that, or you can't uh, have the key... Uh, fallout or things like that and there are a bunch of other military specifications that they have for different locks on uh, or anything else even flashlights it has to be a certain candle power or whatever it is so when you when you hear meet or exceed military specs so, you know usually that's a little bit misleading because there are let's say a dozen specifications to this one specification might be it has to be be made of a a bronze or a brass material that won't be rusting and you know it has to have all brass con construction even the the core so uh you know that's only one specification and there might be dozens so that's always misleading when you see something that says meets military specs or it usually means one specification it might be for you know, the size, you know, that's an easy specification to copy is the size of the lock. So anyway, what we're going to do now, this one here, it doesn't spring open when you turn it. So I don't know if it's supposed to, but I do feel a little bit of a spring in there. So what we're going to do, first of all, the first thing we're going to do is um, we're going to, the key is just a little bit bent. We're going to straight, you see that? There's a little bit of bend in there. We're going to straighten that key out and we're going to clean up the lock and we're going to use the fiber wheel because this is a a brass or br it looks it might be a little bronzish color but it uh, usually brass and what we're going to do is clean it up just get some of this tarnish off of there and then we're going to lubricate it and uh and get out all of the dirt in there you know how we do that with the vacuum and things so let's get to it Now we went over it with the uh, the fiber wheel, and you can see it does a nice job, leaves a nice brushing on it. But now here's the point. You know, again, if you want to have fun, you practice on locks like this. They're not the real expensive ones. But if you notice over here in the back, you see here we have some uh, dents, some dings, some scratches. Now this is where the belt sander comes in real good because we can take it down. And then we could reproduce the finish. Now, you can have it brushed. You can have it polished. You can have it whatever you want. We got the key looking real good. We got in all the grooves. Everything looks nice with the key. You know, it's going to work good. But again, it's not lubricated or anything yet because you wait till later to lubricate it because you don't want the dust and everything from the five wheel mixing in with the lubricant. So we're going to vacuum this lock out after we're finished and lubricate it and, uh, and go through that. So right now, let's get these scratches out here. Okay, and then maybe we'll put a little bit of a polish on here, you know, just make it look nice and presentable. And we're calling this project finished, and you can see uh, here, you can see what we did here. We uh, were able to keep all the nice wreaths on here, nice brush finish on here, took out all the scratches that were in the back, and uh, duplicated the brush finish from the factory, that's just using a real fine belt. Cleaned up everything here. The bottom is all nice and cleaned out. Lubricated it. Used the cleaned everything out with the 50-50. Then Houdini'd it with a cleaner. You can see now it pops open on its own. It's uh, it's just a lovely lock, isn't it? And again, I, I it's just a, a nice color. Now here's the problem. Brass will always, always tarnish. Nothing you could do to stop that except... 
if you wanted to keep this uh, to look similar to like it does now, look at that, you would spray it with clear lacquer. Spray it with clear lacquer, let it dry, but then you, you got to wipe it down first with lacquer thinner, the whole lock, make sure there's no residual polish or anything on there. Spray it with clear lacquer, let it dry, and then that will keep this pretty much shiny for quite a while until sometimes under the edges and stuff you'll see years from now it starts to tarnish but uh and then if you ever had that problem you would have to remove the lacquer with a, a lacquer thinner or remover and then respray the lock but i leave it like this and uh, it'll tarnish naturally but it stays it'll stay like this for a couple of years and look really nice Bruce, thank you very much. Beautiful light. Now, unfortunately, sometimes you could see here the brass or aluminum will really do a job on your wheel. Look at that. You see how that caked it up there? This is just not good now. Now this uh, has a, a bad surface on here. And this is where you have to use the back end of your saw to, uh, to run it through here. You can see here we use the last few teeth of the saw here we're going to run it and then we're going to get rid of this shine this caked up it's a it's a combination of caked up uh compound and and also brass or aluminum whatever you're going to use so this is not good to uh this won't give you a superior finish Now you can see here we got rid of all that shine and everything but what happens is the stitching that holds these uh cotton uh, discs together they sometimes when you do that with the saw they start to come and you don't want to slap in you these things so you got to take either a scissor or I use a nips here and you see here you got to cut these very short here very short to the to the wheel and especially if ever you have any of these flapping around that start coming undone and that's normal when the wheel starts to wear just cut anything that might flap around and smack you when you're uh, on the wheel so that should be good now that wheel although it looks dull this is just what you want because those fibers will absorb the compound and that's what will polish your metal next up we got a little rain moving in here some thunder showers been happening all day again it's humid it's kind of not such great weather as far as comfortable wise but um i want to show you something i have a uh, some uh, interesting we in my weed garden that's coming up and i i always like these i think they look very interesting if you've never seen them before let me show you what they are well as you can see we have another heavy rain probably elsa working its way up the east coast get some remnants of that but the grass is nice and green but look over here this is something that's uh new this year for me and uh you can see i have some milkweed that has come up and uh they're over six foot tall you can see that's a six foot fence, so they're, they're just above it. And uh, they attract a lot of butterflies and different insects. And what's really great is even though I took down my trees, I do have uh, abundance of lightning bugs again this year. And let me show you, I took some video of it uh, last night. So in closing, a uh, special thanks to uh, to everybody who served in the uh, Navy and anybody that knows anybody served in the Navy. Uh, special thanks to Bruce Groton for that beautiful lock we did today. And uh, this is just a short one today. Hope you have a fantastic weekend. Take care now. Bye-bye.